happy Mother's Day to all of our mothers. I was a few weeks ago, the Lord, just in the middle of the week, I forget what day, thank you, of the week it was, the Lord laid a burden on my heart specifically for uh, you sisters, and especially moms with children in the home, but all of you sisters. Um, I think sometimes you probably face things that us men don't realize. Um, for those of us men who go work, whether it's inside the home or outside the home, um, we have pressures that perhaps the world can understand. But I just felt like I got the sense that <clears throat> some of you sisters experience pressures that the world doesn't understand. And it might be easy to forget that. Um, the Bible tells us to live, uh, as husbands, to live with our wives in an understanding way as with weaker vessels, First Peter chapter 3. Otherwise, our prayers will not be heard. And so I asked the Lord to give me a, a deeper understanding of how to pray for you all and uh, to, there are probably many things that you all do in the home that we couldn't do. We recognize that. I know that as a married father with children. Many, most of the things in the home I couldn't do. Now, it's not because I don't want to or I'm lazy. Anything that I can do, I try to help with. But recognize the unique gift, gifts God has given you, sisters. And I want to encourage you just in the faithfulness with which you serve, <clears throat> not only in your families, but also in the church, to press on. The world is full of vying for that which is big and great and visible, and the church is, should be the exact opposite of that in every area. The churches are full of people, uh, uh, you know, the world is full of churches that want to become bigger in size and more well-known and more popular. We should be the exact opposite of that. Not against growth, but that should not be our ambition. The world is full of women that want to be big and famous, preachers, authors, and things like that. Again, if God calls them to, to do that, it's not... The Bible says that a woman should never teach or exercise authority in the church. So that we believe and stand for, but... Um, in, within the boundaries that God has drawn, women can do some tremendous things for his kingdom. The last two hymns we sang were written by godly women. And uh, what a blessing it is to, to see the revelation that God gave them in their, staying within their circle. And for hundreds, thousands of years after that, Madame Guyon lived in the 1700s, were blessed by her words. <clears throat> um, but in a, in, a, in a world that's full of um, uh, things that are contrary to God's word and um, churches that are imitating how things are done in the world. We must be an example. We must be a testimony that we stand for the word of God, not in a legalistic way, not in a judgmental way, in humility and quietness. And what a blessing it is, dear sisters, that you all in this church uh, are exemplifying that quiet looking to God and saying, Lord, You've drawn a circle around my life. I'm going to be faithful within that. I tell you, in eternity, there are going to be some tremendous surprises. Remember how James and John wanted to sit on the right and left hand of Jesus in the kingdom? And Jesus said, the Father gets to decide who that will be. And I've often thought, you know, I aspire for that only because it will make me closer to Jesus. <laughs> Not because you guys will be looking at me on some throne or anything like that. That's, I want to be as close to Jesus for all eternity. That's it. And if the right hand and the left hand of Jesus is where I can be close to him, then sure. Even if it means it's some lowly place where you can't see me. What do you think the throne of heaven looks like? Is it, it's glorious. It's amazing. And yet it's humble. <laughs> I don't think we can understand it. I I don't even want to say more on it because I couldn't do it justice. That God, with all his glorious majesty seated on his throne, Jesus is a servant. 
you'll see a servant sitting on the throne there. <laughs> it's the exact opposite of what you'll see when you go to the White House <laughs> or some other palace, Buckingham Palace or something like that. And, um, but I've often thought that will it be the most famous preacher, the one who did the most miracles? No. It'll be the one who became most like Christ in their spirit of lowliness. And it shouldn't surprise you if there are two sisters <laughs> sitting on either side of Jesus. I, it won't surprise me. Now, I'm not saying who it will be or anything like that. But mostly for us men to learn an example from our wives in the quiet, simple way by which they just go about serving. Think about the sisters who go down and set up for our lunches and clean up afterwards. And now let's learn from them. <clears throat> Jesus said we can learn from the children even. Unless you become like little children, you will not even see the kingdom of heaven. So God bless you, dear sisters, and especially you mothers also on this day. I hope we will remain in gratitude for you every day. Um, I'd like you to turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Last week I was speaking on the difference between religiosity and true spirituality. And for a few weeks now, the Lord has impressed on me that this is a very, very serious thing and something that I think we should be aware, I believe we should be wary of at RLCF. Because the great danger is that in our pursuit of holiness, like I said last week, in our pursuit of holiness, the devil will show us an alternative route. He'll say, you can become like God like this. It's the age-old temptation. God doesn't want you to become like him. You can become like him this way. And the tree of the knowledge of good and evil today is the way that avoids the cross. The cross in my own life. The way of brokenness. The way of denying myself. Taking up the cross and following Jesus. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil today. When I avoid that. And even though that's written in the first pages of the Bible, I believe that Christians today are still falling for that lie of the devil. And I was, I was reading recently in Romans 1 and 2, and you look at the, how depraved things got. You read Romans 1, the horrible, perverse things that it describes there, and it says it's simply because they didn't treat God as God, didn't treat His Word as holy. And so... I believe it's a, it's a danger. I want to make one point here, and that is that, you know, I'm not hung up about the word religio, religion and spiritual. Are you religious or spiritual? The book of James does say, this is pure and undefiled religion. He uses that word. So uh, don't get hung up about that. What I mean by religiosity is the form of spirituality without the power. And the biblical word for that in 2 Timothy 3 is the form of godliness. But I believe in today's language, we understand what religiosity means, the term. That means that you've got a good outward appearance of Christianity in terms of where you go to church and what your family's like and what principles you stand on. Um, you read the Bible, you pray, and you're a good upstanding Christian. But inwardly, you lack the power of God. You really lack the life of Christ in you that's causing you to be changed every day. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4 that he was changed daily. So today I would like us to examine ourselves and together let's look at a few tests that we can look into our own hearts to see whether we're really just religious or if we really are spiritual. <clears throat> there are probably many tests. I hope the Lord will show you some in your own life pertaining to your own tendencies. Uh, but here are some I saw in Scripture. But before that, we read in 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, test yourselves. Did you know that there's such a word in the, in the Bible, a verse in the Bible that says you must test yourself? 1 Corinthians 11 says, Let's, every man, let every man examine himself. Test yourself. For your children who go to school or even school at home, you have to do tests every now and then, right? But it's usually a test given by your mom or dad or by a teacher at school. And you're given that test. In, in the Christian life, 
Nobody's going to give you a test. Now, maybe for you children who are at home, your parents will give you a test to see uh, how you're doing. They'll, they'll ask you how was school or something like that. But as you grow older, it will be up to you. If you don't test yourself in the area in which we're about to read, you could just go on thinking life is good. What does he say? Test yourselves to see if you're in the faith. Now, is, is he talking to unbelievers or to Christians? He's talking to a church that he himself planted, a church in Corinth, and this is the second letter he has written to them. He dealt with a pretty serious sexual issue in the church in the first letter. By the time he writes the second letter, things have gotten better. They've dealt with the problem. They obeyed his instructions and they set the matter right. Then he says in chapter 11, I'm concerned that now you're going to be drawn away from simple, pure devotion to Christ. So, he says, test yourselves to see if you be in the faith. This is a message for Christians, not for unbelievers. Test yourself. Examine yourselves. He repeats himself. Or do you not recognize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? Do you recognize that Jesus Christ is in you? Now, he's not asking, have you asked Jesus into your heart? And you say, oh yes, I did on such and such a date, 1995 or something like that. No. Is Jesus Christ in you unless you fail the test that Jesus Christ is in you? Have you heard of such a message sermon for Christians? Let's read that carefully again. Do you not recognize this about yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you fail the test? But I trust that you will realize that we ourselves do not fail the test. So test yourselves. Test yourselves, when it says, to see if Jesus Christ is in you, that means that you actually have spiritual life in you, not just the language around it. So here are a few tests that the Lord has been using in my own heart I thought I would share with you, and I hope that, that he will show you more in your own life. The first is, if you secretly love self and money, but you talk about loving God. Let's turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3. If you secretly love self and money, but you talk about loving God, that means you have, the language is there, you come to the meeting, and even at home, well, what comes out of your mouth is all religious language. But in your heart, and this is an area that God has kept private, and that's the thing, for most spiritual, the, re, the reason spirituality is so rare and religiosity is so common is because to be spiritual, you have to pay attention to the inside. What are you like on the inside? It doesn't matter if the whole world thinks that you're a wonderful Christian. Who are you? Test yourself. Don't test yourself by what people think of you, what reputation you have in the church. You must test yourself by what you know about yourself, about the thoughts that dominate your own life, your own mind throughout the day. Use that as the gauge. Say, Lord, I know when I'm, at, when I'm around my brothers and sisters in the church or the children or on a Sunday morning, lots of religious talk comes out of my mouth. But when I'm by myself, I find myself just thinking about money all the time. You're probably religious then. I find I'm thinking about myself. I'm just self-centered in my thought. Oh, how they treated me or this or that about myself. If you secretly love self and money, but talk about loving God and you're religious... <clears throat> 2 Timothy 3, it says in verse 2 that, you know, he says, verse 1, the last days, difficult times will come. Men will be lovers of self and lovers of money. And he says in verse 5, holding to the form of godliness. So they'll still say, I'm a Christian. I'm a conservative. I go to such and such a church. I go to RLCF. We believe in the new covenant. I hear good sermons and I listen to a sermon every day. And I have the Bible on audio playing and all this stuff. But secretly in your heart, you love money. You love yourself. And that, that self-centered, money-centered person inside direct, dictates the decisions you make and what you spend your time thinking about and how you make choices on this earth. Uh, that, that song, go back and meditate on it. If you need the words, we'll post it, share it with the church. You can share it, find it online that Amy Carmichael wrote. The subtle love of com complacency, subtle love of comfort on this earth is such a danger. The love of self and the love of money. Um, and I, was, I said, I made the statement in, at the end of the message last week, but I'll say it again. 
True spirituality is interested in the kingdom of heaven more than heaven itself. Many Christians, they say, I'm a Christian, I want to go to heaven. That could be a love of self. Because who wants to go to hell? It's a miserable place to go. And you could be a self-loving person saying, I want to go to heaven. Because, I mean, it's like offering kids, do you want Brussels sprouts or ice cream? <laughs> Right uh, now, I, I like Brussels sprouts, and uh, it's actually one of our favorites in our home. But if you think of something that's really tasteless, like a horrible acidic medicine or ice cream, well, of course, yeah. Every self-loving person will say, yeah, give me that which tastes good. And heaven could be that ice cream that the devil has painted in front of our eyes and given us this picture of what heaven is, imagining that I can get there with my love of self still here. That's a lie. Ask yourself today, are you more interested in the kingdom of heaven today, here on earth? The kingdom of heaven is within you, Jesus said. The kingdom of heaven is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Are you interested in that? Then you're a spiritual person. But if you just want to go to heaven, you've got the form. You don't want the burning. You want the streets of gold and the crown on your head. That's a lie of the devil. The kingdom of heaven. You, you can test yourself today to know if you're really in the faith, if Christ Jesus is really in you, by whether the, you're taken up with the kingdom of heaven more than what will happen to you after you die. You know, Paul had many co-workers. Many of them were good. Some of them, like Demas, fell away. But look at what he says in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. He says in verse 19, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition because I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare. Paul says, I don't even have one person. What about Titus? What about Epaphroditus? And now I don't know. I don't want to read too much into it because they also seem to be very godly people. But Paul said he picked out Timothy as the one person whom he said, I don't have anybody who's got the same spirit that I have. Not the same religion. Well, of course, all these others had the same religion that Paul had. They believe in Jesus Christ. But the same spirit that Paul had. This is spirituality. The spirit that is concerned for the welfare of others genuinely. Like I really don't care about myself. I care about my brother. I care about my sister. I care about my wife. I care about my children. Not because they're mine, but because I want to build them up. I want what will benefit them. And look at what he goes on to say in verse 21. Not even out of a desire for them. Because he says, for they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. If you're only seeking your own interests, not the interests of Christ Jesus, if in any situation you, your thoughts are, di are directed by, how will this help me? More than, how will this glorify God? You're a religious person. You're, yeah, I know, you go to church and you, 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 you pray over your job and you pray over your meal and all that, but it's, that meal is self-centered, that job is self-centered, that pursuit, that goal is self-centered. With the Christian veneer, polish around it. And that's religiosity. Genuinely concerned for the welfare of others, for your welfare. Seeking after the interests of Christ Jesus. If you love self, and, and, and you, but you talk about loving God, then you're religious. Now, if you just love self, and you don't even talk about loving God, then you're a worldly person. But a lot of people think, well, I'm, not, I'm no longer worldly. When I was unconverted, I used to, be, I used to talk about the uh, worldly things and interested in worldly things. But the danger is that once we are born again, the devil says, okay, I, I couldn't keep them in the world. Now they're sitting in churches instead of sitting and watching football on a Sunday morning. Now I've got to find some other way to get them to avoid the cross. So let me give them a way by which they can just talk about God. But inwardly they just love themselves. They love appearing spiritual in front of others. They love all those other things. They love themselves. They love money. But they've got the language. Now they are same, the same inwardly dead people just sitting in the church instead of sitting at the football stadium or sitting out in the bar or something like that. That's a lie. What about the love of money? Let's turn to Matthew chapter 6. It's very easy for us to think that because 
We may not be millionaires and billionaires. We don't love money. And that's another lie of the devil. There are probably very, very rich people who don't love money as much as there are also very, 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 very poor people who love money. The love of money has nothing to do with how much you have. And that's, again, the lie of the devil. I might think, well, I think, can think of somebody who has more money than me, so I must not love money as much as he does. No. The love of money is a, it's like layers of an onion. You, you peel it off and you realize it's there. It's more deep-rooted than you realize. And it has nothing to do with how much money is actually in the account, in the bank account, or how much you have saved. Matthew 6, Jesus said, First of all, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other. Let me, let, let's take God's word. I know you've heard this verse before, but imagine if you were reading this verse for the very first time, that you'd never had a Bible in your hand before. And for the very first time, somebody gave you this and said, this is the word of God. Every other book will perish. This will never perish. And what God says here will never perish. And God said, you're either loving me and hating money, or you're loving money and hating me. That's it. There's no other option. If you love money, even a little bit, you hate me. With all the polish around it and all that, he says, but if you love me, then there will be a hatred for money, no matter how much you have. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth, God and mammon. You cannot. Oh, but the devil will say, did God really say you shouldn't eat out of the tree? Did God really say you cannot love God, God and man? What about all those other preachers that seem to have some good, good things to say about God and they talk about devotion to Jesus, but they talk about money and they love money and they, they want you to give money to themselves? Like I've said it, like we say often, Thank God we don't have a donate now button on our website and maybe we never will, I don't know. I'm not against that, but you see, for, for most churches, the focus of dependency is on money. And I tell you this, the danger is that it can become a replacement for the Holy Spirit. Do you realize that if we were completely broke, didn't even have a building to sit in, barely had clothes to keep us warm, but we had the Holy Spirit within us, that would be all we need? That's what the early church had. They met in caves running for their lives, but the Holy Spirit was in their midst. And today we have churches that are interested in making the building expanded. And, and of course, yeah, they talk about the evangelistic work they're doing and they're reaching out so-and-so and reaching out so-and-so. They love money. Now, I'm not here. To, I, I, I really believe it. Nobody can tell you whether you love money or not. We might be able to see evidences of it by how you live your life and how you make your choices, but only you and God and the devil know whether you love money. That's it. Not even your spouse. You could be a wife who's not even the breadwinner in the home, let's say, and love money. Oh, yes. It doesn't matter who you are. You could be a child growing up as a teenager and already the love of money has found a root in your heart, perhaps because of the example of your parents. And that's why we preach against that in this church and, and, and we'll continue to do so and oh, that children, that you'll grow up as much as we want you to be educated and learn the things that you need to know on this earth, oh, that you will cry out in your heart, Lord, preserve me from the love of money and let that be your cry until the end of your life. Do you think that if God freed you from the love of money in some area, you don't have to pray for that anymore? You don't think the devil will bring some other area? He wants you to come to the place where you don't love God. That's it. And if he can get a little bit of the love of money into your life, he knows that the hatred of God has already come in. Let me make it plain and simple. You are a hater of God if there's a little bit of love of money in you. Now, you might think, okay, how do I know if I have the love of money? Let's continue reading. For me, it's the next page, but for you, it might not be. It's the very next verse. For this reason, I say to you, don't be worried about your life. And I have found that one of the surest ways to test the love of money in my life is to see if there's anxiety in my life. If there's anxiety for even one second in my life, that's one second that I had the love of money in my life. Worry. Oh, how is this going to work out? Anxiety. And I'm, I'm not here to condemn you, please, brothers and sisters and children even. I see it in my own flesh and I hate it. More, the more I see it. And I hope that in what I'm sharing today that you will be called up to a higher life. 
Even if you see that many people around you, even so-called Christians, are living lives that are plagued with anxiety and worry, where any time something else comes up, there's worry immediately there. And you sit worried for five minutes or ten minutes or an hour or a day or a month. Let it, that's a month that you loved money. You loved mammon somehow. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? He talks about the birds and the lilies. Verse 30, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? You of little faith, do not worry then, saying, what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear for clothing? And what does that mean? You know, it means that how will I make it? How will I have enough to live and to provide for myself and for my family, including my children's education, so that they can live and provide for themselves when they grow up? For the Gentiles, verse 32, eagerly seek these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Oh, your heavenly Father knows what you need. This week and the weeks to come and the months to come and the years to come. But seek, be different from the Gentiles. That's what he's saying. But, verse 33, be different from the Gentiles in this. How are you different from the rest of the world? Is it because you read the Bible and you pray to Jesus? No. Prove that you're different from the rest of the world by the fact that there's no anxiety in your life. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. So he says it again. So do not worry about tomorrow for tomorrow you will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Seek to be freed from the love of money. If you secretly love self or money but talk about loving God, you're a religious person, not spiritual. Secondly, if you are quick to find fault with others, but you justify yourself. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 23. If you're quick to find fault with others, you immediately see the glaring fault in your wife, or your husband, or your children even, or other brothers or sisters, or your boss. But you justify yourself whenever you see something in you, or somebody points out something in you. Then you're a religious person, not a spiritual person. Matthew 23, verse 4, it says the Pharisees, they were experts at religious, being religious. They tie up heavy burdens and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves are unwilling to move them with so much as a finger. Matthew 23, verse 4. They lay heavy burdens on others, but they won't lift even a finger to help them. They're quick to find fault. Immediately that they see a fault in somebody. Um, there was a saying I heard, it says, before you flare up, I think my parents used to have that in our home somewhere. I somehow recall seeing it. Before you flare up at someone else's faults, take time to count 10 faults of your own. <laughs> before you flare up at someone else's faults, wait and count 10 of them. Not their faults, your own. <laughs> Let me say that again. Before you flare up at another's fault, take time to count 10. 10 faults, 10 of your own. And after you've counted 10 of your, say, okay, I see that in that person. Immediately I see that fault. Maybe a sin even. He say, Lord, show me my fault. He looked beyond my fault and saw my need. We sing in that song. He say, Lord, make me like that. I want to look beyond their fault, see their need. Now, we're not going to sweep sin under the carpet. If you've been in this church even a few times, you know that we, we don't condone sin. We don't believe in sweeping sin under the carpet. And we'll stand for that. However, let's examine ourselves. Let's see, Lord, I want to see the fault in my own life. Show me my sin, Lord. I am the sinner. Show me what a great sinner I am. And after you've counted 10 of those, what that will do if you truly repent, you will see the joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. And you'll find more of that joy and says, Lord, I'm not done with 10. I probably have about 100 more faults of my own. Continue to show that to me. And you see how that brings a slowness in our lives into pointing a finger at others, finding fault with them. Because I've counted, I see, Lord, I've, I've been so loved, I'll risk loving too. I want to live as one who's been forgiven. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 11.
I believe that one of the reasons that there is sickness, you know, there's many reasons for sickness and a lack of health and disease and whatever. Some of it is just because of the nature of the world we live in. And uh, the world is under a curse, we're not. But the flesh that we live in, we're still in flesh, that, that is uh, under that curse that God, God didn't curse man, you know that, right? He cursed the ground. And so there's, there's a curse that's upon the earth. Christ has redeemed us from the curse. However, as long as we're in this body, we'll still experience sickness and death. Right? We know that. that that's, while our outer man is decaying, our inner man is being renewed. So part of that being spiritual on the inside, not being religious, is that we recognize our outer man will still decay. We might have sickness. However, there are other types of sicknesses. James 5 talks about a sickness that is a result of, um, not con uh, of unconfessed sin. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and... Uh, Pray, let the elders lay hands over you and pray for you. That's why whenever we pray for anybody who asks for healing uh, and we anoint them with oil, we always ask, is there any unconfessed sin in your life? If there is, then we could pray and it's a wasted prayer because the sin has not been confessed. If you confess that sin, immediately you might experience healing. Um, another thing is if you haven't forgiven somebody else, if you hold on to unforgiveness in your heart, God won't forgive you and that sickness could remain. So there are some sicknesses that are related to that. Here's another sickness that is a result of a person judging others. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 30. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick and a number are dead even, died. Because, he says verse 31, if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. These were a bunch of people that were busy judging others. And finding fault in the others. And say, oh, that brother's like that. That sister's like that. My wife's like this. My husband looks like that. And that's the problem in our home. We have this sickness in my home because my husband is like this or like that. Or my wife is like this or like that. And he says, if you judged yourself rightly, you wouldn't be judged. Look, look at that. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick. And a number have even died. So test ourselves. First in this, you know, if you're quick to find fault with others, but you justify yourself. Um, it's becoming popular. I, I, I don't know, among Christians today, to post publicly, uh, whether it's on Facebook or Twitter or uh, whatever, just point the faults with others. And a lot of it, I, I, I'm not here to judge anybody, but I recognize that a lot of that comes from maybe wanting to vent. <laughs> Uh, you've got this stuff, this, somebody treated you badly or, or something like that. And, and it's not to condone the fact that they did that bad thing, maybe. But the devil will kill two birds with one stone by allowing that bad thing to have been done to you and then for you to judge them over it and to have a bitterness towards them over it. Or worse, to spread it across the whole world. And I'll tell you, the internet is one of the most... I believe the Lord's using the internet for his glory, by the way. But the devil's also using it for his kingdom. And the devil's allowing a lot of things to spread that might not otherwise spread because of the internet. So be wary of it. When you see somebody post something or share something, gossip can spread a lot more quickly on the internet than it used to before the internet. Because now you just spread from one person to the other and then they go person to person. But now with the internet, you could spread gossip and, and evil speaking and slander much more quickly. Be wary of it, dear brothers and dear sisters. Children, be wary if and when you do have access to the internet and your own accounts and such, be careful how you use it because the devil will allow sin to spread. And don't be a part of it. Have nothing to do with those un un uh, evil works. Um, so that's uh, judging others, justifying ourselves. Jesus said in Luke chapter 16 about the Pharisees. If you find when somebody points out a fault in you, immediately there's a, ah, oh, but you didn't understand me or you don't know the whole story or that. Now, maybe they don't, but just realize that it doesn't matter what that person thinks. If somebody points out a fault in you, you go and judge yourself in the light of God. And if God shows you that that person was right, then you'll be freed of it. If God shows you that that person is wrong, then you just ignore what that person has said. Take everything. I tell you, you know, 
a lot of people send hurtful, have done in the past, say hurtful things about me and all that. I tell you honestly, as I've matured, as I've sought to become more spiritual and less and, uh, than religious, I take everything that people say about me and I say, Lord, you show me. Is it true? Is it possible that what this person has said about me could actually be true and I don't see it? Now, I'm not talking about like, usually if it's somebody who loves me, my wife, my children, you all, brothers and sisters, when you come to me and point out something in me, I value that because I know you love me. I'm talking about people that aren't in my life, that maybe have, they're not vested in my life. They don't, they're not interested in building fellowship, but they want to point out faults in others. When I receive such criticism and, and uh, even slander that's spoken about me, I hear about it. I say, Lord, is it true? Because you can use even my enemy to point out something that's unchrist like in me, can't he? Of course he can. What if God said, you know, I want to test Santosh if he's really spiritual. And I want to send his enemy to say something to him to see if I can use his enemy to point out an area of unchrist likeness. Because Santosh always prays, Lord, show me if there's any unchrist likeness in me. But do you add to that, but only let it be from so and so and so and so? No, <laughs> there's no condition to that. God may say, okay, you really want that? I'm going to send an enemy to you. Or I'm going to allow you to find out about something somebody who hates you has said about you. Now, what will you do with that? You don't have to be condemned about it, but go and judge yourself. If you judge yourself, you'll be happy and you won't be judged. The Pharisees, on the other hand, it says in verse 14 of Luke 16. Luke 16, verse 14. The Pharisees, who were lovers of money, we already heard about that. And they were, like I said, the experts at being religious, were listening to all these things and were scoffing at him. And he said to them, you are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men but God knows your hearts. You are those who justify yourselves in the sight of man. Oh, be wary of it, dear brothers and sisters. Be wary of the, the instinct that wants to justify itself and say, oh, you, you know, I, but this, but that, making excuses for your sin have nothing to do with it. It's the spirit of religiosity, it's the spirit of the Pharisees. For that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. Now the reason that the Pharisees justified themselves, the reason that the religious people justify themselves is, what I was, is the third thing I want to say. And that is, if you crave a reputation as a godly person, if you crave a reputation as a godly person, you want to be known among others. This is what Jesus just said about the Pharisees. If you want to be known as a godly person, more than actually being a godly person, whether people realize it or not. Think about it, even in our church. Do you want to be known as a spiritual person? Like, oh, he's got a knowledge of the word, or he, you know, he knows this verse, knows that verse. Uh, known as a godly person. Do you care about the reputation of others? You're probably religious. Jesus said in John chapter 2, look at this amazing verse. You know, Jesus' life is, is an example for us in every area. And he lived among people where religiosity was at its height in Israel. The Pharisees had, uh, had refined religiosity and legalism. They'd become experts at it. And then came the true spiritual person, Jesus Christ. The Word become flesh. So here he says in John 2, verse 24, yeah, okay, look at this in verse 23. When he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name. He started to get a reputation as a, a rabbi, as somebody worth following, somebody to believe in. Observing his signs which he was doing, he did many miracles, and many people were taken up with the miracles that he was doing. And then it's, look at what it says about Jesus. Do you really want to be spiritual? Let's say God used you in some miraculous way to be a blessing to somebody. To even perhaps do a miracle. To heal somebody genuinely. What will be your response when everybody is like, oh, do you hear what he did? He did that miracle. He laid his hands on that person and that person actually had his eyes opened. Not this half-baked miracles that's going on in Christendom today. Real miracle. Now's the test. Will you be religious or spiritual? Verse 24, Jesus on his part was not entrusting himself to them. He says, I know you guys are believing in me now, but I, I see what's in your heart. Because he knew all men, and because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, 
for he himself knew what was in man. One of the reasons that Jesus came down to this earth, according to this verse, was to say, I know what's in your flesh. I know what's in my flesh, and I know what's in your, your flesh. And so when Jesus heard the praises of the people, he says, don't try to pretend. I know what's in your flesh. I know that, that those words come from flesh that's rotten, sinful flesh. So it means nothing to me. Now can you look at the praises of people and say, they're just coming from man, from women, from dust. The, the, the opinion of God is what matters. He's eternal. That man or that woman that praises you will fade like the grass. All flesh will fade. But the word of God abides forever. God's opinion of you is the only thing that matters. If you crave the opinion of people as a godly person, as a Christian, as a as a godly person, probably religious, recognize that the opinions of the, that the people whose opinions you seem to be affected by are just flesh. That's why Jesus says, I can't entrust myself to you. I entrust myself to the Father. And if you entrust yourself to him, we'll have fellowship together. But your praises and your criticisms, I take it before my Father. He's the only one I trust. So do that, both with criticism and with praise. I tell you, brothers and sisters, honestly, in my heart, I do that. When I receive criticism, when I hear about criticism, when I receive praise, I say, Lord, what is your opinion of me? That's the only thing that matters. Those words, those glorious words that people said about me, it'll fade. Heaven and earth and all those words that they said about me will fade. But the word of God will abide forever. The fourth thing I'll say is, if you're more interested in the word than in the word becoming flesh in you, if you're more interested in the word the Bible, the Word of God. A lot of people stand for it. it. must be this translation of the Bible or that translation of the Bible. You're more interested in that than that Word actually becoming flesh in you. That's the most important thing. If you're more interested in the Word than in the Word becoming flesh in you, you're probably religious. I tell you, this is important. Because we, we, we do preach the Word. We, we say we must preach the Word in all its accuracy. But I'll tell you why we want to be accurate with the word is so that we have the fullness of Christ in us in all its life. So, uh, you know, like you've heard us say, more than, you know, a lot of people talk about going, reading, going through the Bible. What about the Bible going through you? You've heard Zach say that. That's the most important thing. Did the entire word of God go through you? Did it become life in you? Because they had the word for thousands of years. And they became Pharisees. They became religious people. And then everything changed when the word became flesh. Jesus came and says, this is what it actually looks like on the inside. So what's the result of loving the word? You know, for example, long prayers. I call them sermon prayers, where there's a lot of scriptures recited in the prayers. Now, I do believe in praying the word of God. I believe that. Praying promises. But there's a reason for it. But I've heard a lot of prayers that are sermons. They're being prayed so that people can hear my sermon that I prayed in this prayer. Oh, it's Christendom is full of it. They're prayers that they pray, but and they're full of, you know, it's a little sermon that got preached, and people got impressed with this prayer that was preached, that was really, really a little sermon. Pray God's word, but pray it as a promise. Claim God's word, if you will, but pray to God. Oh, that you will pray to God and more and more. I, it's, it's a battle, I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, because we have full, Christendom is full of religious prayers. Full of religious prayers. People who pray and they seem to be godly, but they're just religious. And if you're a spiritual person, you can, you can discern that fairly quickly. But pray, pray to God and say, Lord, I want you to pray. I want to become more like you so that even when I'm in public, I can pray a truly spiritual prayer. And it's, it's getting better in my life. I want to be honest with you. If you've been here for a few years and you compare the prayers I used to pray in front many years ago with where, where I am today, I'm not asking you to, to, you know, to say I'm good or bad or anything like that. I'll tell you, I examine myself. I've learned, even as I lead us in prayer during our times of praise, to be let more and more free. Where I'm praying to God and say, Lord, I want you to move through this prayer. It doesn't matter whether they were impressed by it or not. I, that's the connection point I want to make. And whether I use, whether I fumble over my words and I, I, I mess up or anything like that, Lord, you know my heart and I want you to hear that prayer. And I don't want to just impress people by praying a little sermon in my prayer. Oh, that we will pray such prayers, whether in secret and in, and, and, and in our prayer meetings. If you have to pray in public, 
all pray. Pray like that. Another aspect of religious, you love the word, is that intellectual Bible studies. You know, we, there used to be people in this church who, who were upset that our Bible studies were not as intellectual. And what I mean by that is they thought that it should be a study where everybody says whatever comes to their mind instead of listening to a prophet speak. You know what the book of Acts says, how our meetings should be? Let the prophets speak first, two or three, and then let others pass judgment. And we believe in that. We're not interested in everybody thinking they're a prophet. And yeah, we believe in the gift of prophecy. But there are certain ones that God has given to be the prophets in the church. I tell you, whether we're listening to a video or listening to a prophet who's physically present, it doesn't matter. Do you believe that God wants to move and have a prophet speak even through a video? And now I believe God will get religious people offended by that and allow them to leave as he has. But don't be taken up with that. Oh, that you will discern the, that where a prophetic word is coming from more than just, ah, oh, let's just have a Bible study and you say, ah, oh, I think this means that. I think this means that. This is what I went through this week. And the devil will get in and find a foothold in those Bible studies and destroy them with religiosity. And we'll end up like the Pharisees did. You know what the Pharisees did? They sat around and discussed the Torah. They discussed the Bible. And discussed, ah, oh, this means that. No, let's go back to the original text. And somebody else with a little bit more knowledge of the Greek said, so, no, no, this actually means that. That's what's going on in Christendom today. Don't fall for it, brothers and sisters. It'll lead you down the path of religiosity, intellectual Bible studies. Um... Another thing I find popular is quoting godly men. And you think I'm spiritual because of it. You know the Pharisees used to do that. Go back to Matthew 23. In, um, in one place, I think in Matthew 3, they say we Abraham is our father. They, they gloried in their connection to Abraham. Now, let's, let's face it. You know, we, Brother Zach has had a significant influence in our church. But that will never be our glory. Our glory is Jesus Christ alone. God has used him as in, in, as a, in the gift of an apostle, I believe, and even as a prophet in this church. But our connection is to Jesus Christ, and in him alone we glory, not our connection to any man. And that's how you can become religious. That's how denominations, oh, we're connected with so-and-so, he comes and speaks to our church, so-and-so, or we're connected, we're affiliated with this denomination, that founded by so-and-so. This is humbug, it's garbage. Every local expression of the church must be alive with the fire of God there. That's what makes the difference. And we welcome the influence of truly godly men. But look at it says in Matthew 23 verse 30 that, uh, verse 29, Woe to you, religious people, he's saying, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had been living in the days of our fathers we would not have been partners with them in shedding the blood of the prophets. In other words, yeah, if, if I was a part of Tozer's church, I would have been a godly man. <laughs> we have Tozer's quotes today. And if I was in his church, no, you probably wouldn't have. You really don't know A.W. Tozer and uh, other godly men like that or David Wilkerson in this country. We love to have their quotes, but we don't serve the same God. We don't have the same fire, radical hatred for sin that they did. But, you know, I've been in churches where they have Tozer's quotes and I sit there and no, this is not a Tozer church. Tozer would leave that church and he'd leave his quote on the screen. Let's be a church, whether it's Tozer or Zach or Wilkerson or whoever, Faber and Charles, John Wesley. These are men that are help us shine the light on Jesus Christ himself. That's what's important. Have you seen Jesus? Test yourself. Do you, is Christ really in you? That's what matters. Um... Not just quoting some godly men. Another way, that the, use of, the use of tongue. Oh, James says, you know that verse, James chapter 1. We live in a Christendom, a religious Christendom, where a lot of people are interested in speaking in tongues. And I believe in the gift of tongues. It's a valid gift today as well. But I'll tell you what's more important is that whether you speak in tongues or not, because God may give you that gift, he may not. He doesn't give it to everybody. Whether you speak in tongues or not, what's more important is that you have control over your tongue. If you don't have control over your tongue, but you speak in tongues, you're religious. And I'll tell you what James says. James 1 verse 26. If anyone thinks himself to be religious, truly religious, and yet does not control his tongue, he deceives himself. This man's Christianity is worth zero. 
Now you may say, can such a person still go to heaven? Because they asked Jesus into their heart and they, and they repented of their sins. I don't know. I'm not the one that decides who gets to go to heaven and who gets to go to hell. God will do that. But I'll tell you, if Jesus says your religion is, your Christianity is worth zero, I don't want to take the risk and assume that I'm probably going to heaven when I'm not. If Jesus, through the, if the Holy Spirit himself says your Christianity is worth zero, yeah, I know you did that other thing and you did that other thing and you shared that tract and you were, went to this place and they even asked you to share something and you prayed and you're raising a godly home, but your religion is worth zero because you can't control your tongue. It's, uh, that's why we speak against gossip in this church so much. Because, oh, God forbid that every, any one of us sitting in this church would get to the end of our life and God say, I drew a big zero over. You filled out every answer, every answer in the test. There's 100 questions. You answered all of them, but you got a zero. Wow. You think it's actually going to happen? I know it's going to happen because I believe God's word. To people who thought they were Christians because they said a prayer and they, their preachers coddled them and, and, and patted them on the back saying, it's okay, it's okay, continue with your gossip and let this gossip just go unaddressed. Oh, I probably receive more criticism for standing against gossip than any other sin, I think, in this church, likewise. But God takes it seriously, I believe. Let's, let's take it seriously. <clears throat> Number five, if you don't think of yourself as just as unworthy to be accepted by God today as when you first came to him, if you don't think of yourself just as unworthy to be accepted by God today as when you first came to him. Then you're probably religious. Second Timothy 3 talks about people who are boastful. Uh, Luke chapter 18. I'll tell you this. I am myself just as unworthy today to be accepted by God as I was the day I came to him as a wretched sinner. He's cleansed me of all sin. But the only reason I'm accepted today is because Jesus Christ's righteousness are what cover me, what clothe me. I'm clothed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the same righteousness of Jesus Christ that I was clothed in when I was first born again. And underneath this wretched, sinful Santosh died and is being renewed to newness of life day by day. It's becoming more Christ-like. But the fact that I'm becoming more Christ-like every day does not make me more accepted by God today. And that's what the Pharisees misunderstood. They cleaned the outside of the cup. And they thought, well, I'm more accepted by God today. And this Pharisee's been a, uh, been, been a follower of God for so long. And so and so is only so long. So he, he's more valuable. Luke 18. You know this prayer. Here was a wretched, sinful man and a religious man sitting in the same church. Sitting in the same church, a religious man and a sinner. And at the end of the story, one of them is truly spiritual. The other is just as religious as he always was. That's the, that's the point of the story. And the religious man, verse 11, stood and was praying thus to himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, Maybe he used to be that. Lord, I used to be that when I was born again. Drunk, swindler, all those things, whatever sins you did. But now, I've been a Christian for 10 years. I thank you that I'm not like that anymore. And then in walks that drunk <laughs> that I used to be. I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector over there in the back. Why am I not like him? I fast twice a week. I pay tithes of all that I get. Look at that. I fast. I, these religious things that I do. I'm raising. What, what is that? Do you fast twice a week? I don't know. It's up to you. Do you tithe? It's up to you. Well, how much money you give. But for us, what is it today? I have a godly home. Look at my children. They're all well behaved. I go to a good church. I'm seeking after uh, a godly life. And I'm not like those backslidden churches. I left those churches to, to, to be a part of a living church. All, all these things that are outward things. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, the way of the back, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house, the tax collector, justified, spiritual, <laughs> rather than 
the other sitting in front. And the great danger, my dear brothers and sisters, is that religious people will remain religious sitting in churches unless we preach messages like this against religiosity. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Some time ago, the Lord laid this thought in my heart. I'll share with you. I imagined myself going to heaven, walking through those gates, and uh, just seeing all the people who were there, and Jesus himself, the man who won my salvation, God, my Savior, my head. And I thought, what would be my immediate thought? And I realized my immediate thought will be, Lord, what am I doing here? I don't deserve to be here. When I get there, I want you to know, I believe with all of my heart, I will be fully conformed into the image of Jesus. Because I believe Romans 8 verse 29. And I believe 1 John 3 verse 3 that says, when I see him, I will be like him. I believe it with all my heart. The devil cannot shake me from that foundation, from that hope, which is my destination. This is predestination, Romans 8 29. God has determined my destination, that I will be fully conformed to the image of Jesus. But Knowing that, standing there, fully conformed into the image of Jesus, I tell you, I will say, Lord, what am I doing here? I don't deserve to be here. And it's not what sins I've done or what sins I've not done. And maybe there's somebody else in heaven that's done more sins than I am. I'll just recognize, Lord, even that one sin I did disqualified me from heaven. Thank you that you've accepted me by the righteousness of Jesus. I look at the righteousness of Jesus and say, that's the only reason I'm here. I don't deserve to be here. And for all in heaven, all eternity, I'll say, I don't deserve to be here, but I'm here. Full of joy. Full of gratitude for what God has done for me. And I hope to live my whole life that way. Okay, last one. If you're more interested in evangelism than in personal sanctification, not just your own personal sanctification, but the sanctification of those whom you're trying to evangelize, if that's the reason that you're evangelizing, Matthew 23 Verse 15. Woe to you, religious people, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you travel around on sea and land to make one convert. This is evangelism at its best. Like I said last week, they traveled further than Jesus ever did. The religious people of Jesus' day did more traveling evangelism than Jesus did. But Jesus built the church. And how we will build the church is if we follow Jesus' example. If God calls you to travel sea and land, that's great. If he calls you to stay in your town or in your home, do it. But make a disciple. Build up the people that you serve to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Otherwise, you'll make them twofold, twice as much a son of hell as yourself. And there's a lot of people speaking about evangelism and talking about evangelism and even doing evangelism, but making those converts twice a child of hell. We are for evangelism. I believe we should. And I thank God for many, some of you in our midst whom God has called as evangelists. All of us must be witnesses. And some of you are, have the gift of an evangelist. That's wonderful. And I praise God, but that gift of evangelist must lead to disciples, whether they become a part of this church or other churches where they're really being led to discipleship, that they don't become twice a child of hell. How do you become twice a child of hell? That you went and gave that person in the other side of town or the other side of the country or the other side of the world a gospel that told him you can continue to love yourself and just say this prayer and, and ask Jesus into your heart, but you don't really, you're not really shown hatred for self and the hatred for money. And becoming a true lover of God. And when we do that, we say, do you really want to hate yourself? Do you really want to hate money? Then give your life to Jesus and see what he will do to you. And if that's the kind of evangelism that's happening, may God do so and use us to do it as well. And to lead other people to become disciples of Jesus. Not to think that they're on their way to heaven when they're really on their way to hell. See, that's worse See, some people in the world, you know, you hear this, it's a, it's a disgrace to God. But people in the world say, I'm on my way to hell and yeah, it's going to be one great party with all my friends in hell. Let them be. What's worse than that? Do you think it's possible to be worse than that? Yes. That you tell somebody he's on his way to heaven, but he's actually on his way to hell. Because we preach them another gospel. Yeah. And our evangelism, like I said last week, must not be even because I feel sorry for the lost. 
There's, that's going on in Christendom as well. I'm, I, I want to evangelize the, that person because I feel sorry that he's going to hell. No. I feel sorry that God's name is dishonored by the way he's living that sinful life. It's the name of God that I honor and reverence so much that causes me to be an evangelist, to raise the kingdom of, to spread the kingdom of God. When you see your co-workers swearing and cursing and all that, does that bring a grief in your heart? Say, Lord, give me a prophetic word to lead that man, that woman, to be your disciple because I have a burden for your name. Not even because I feel sorry that he's going to hell. This is how we will change the world, dear brothers and sisters. It'll be, it may not be big. I tell you, if you want to get people to go to heaven, you can gather a multitude. But if you want people to be taken up to the kingdom of heaven and to be his disciples, it will be a small, it will be a narrow way, and there will be few that find it. But let's be among those few. Amen.